Well, boys and girls, as you can clearly see, my voice is still very much in the lacking department. But that's okay, because I made this video to teach for me. Yay, video teaches for me. So today we're going to talk a little bit about the deep ocean currents. For these ones, it's all about the density. So keep in mind that there is a response in the deep ocean from what's happening on the surface. So those five gyres, they're moving heat, they're moving salt around the ocean from one area to the next. Most notably, the Gulf Stream, right, carries all that nice, warm, tropical Gulf-type air all the way right over to England, pretty much, which is one of the reasons why they're so nice and warm. However, because we're moving heat and we're moving salt around, heat and salinity are both very much important factors in the density of the water. So we're changing the density. More salt is going to give you more dense water. The more heat that's in the water will give you less dense water, right? Because hotter things, thermal expansion, they expand out, and then they become less dense than the things around them. Anything that's more dense is going to sink, and anything that's less dense will be rising. That's just how it works. As a result, you get this density-driven vertical movement that happens in the water, as well as a nice horizontal movement responding from the surface. This vertical circulation is called the thermohaline circulation. Thermo being heat and haline being salt. So it's all about the heat and the salt in the water, and that is what drives uh, delightful amounts of circulation. Here's a little graph showing you how uh, the ocean's volume changes and how water changes based on temperature and salinity. It's kind of fun. And yep, this is that basic area that we're looking at for the thermohaline circulator. All right, so water near the surface is going to be very, what do you think? Talk about density. I'm waiting. This is 20 points. We're in class. Let's have it. Yeah, it's not very dense. And in fact, it's also very warm, but it's going to become colder because heat is being transferred to the atmosphere. It's being transferred to those bodies of land. And on top of that, it's also going to become saltier. That's weird, isn't it? wonder how that happens. What do you guys think? That's right, it becomes saltier because that water evaporating off the top leaves the salt behind. Salt's a very common evaporite mineral. It's one of our hydrogen sediments. And so when the water evaporates, it's leaving the salt behind. So the water becomes colder as it loses heat to the atmosphere. The water becomes saltier. If we remember back from the previous slide, now we have more salt, less heat. That's going to make it more dense. It's going down. And as it goes down, it's going to push the less dense water around it and move upwards. So what's the end result? <coughs> the densest water, we have a few questions, is formed where? Yeah, it's going to be at the poles because it's really, really cold. So the dense water from those poles, it's also going to flow towards the equator because you've got this area of high density, an area of low density in the middle, and it's pretty much just another system of ooh, diffusion. So if you have the Earth and you've got the poles here and here where that is a lot denser, down here you have the equator less dense, so boop, boop, boop. The water moves from the poles to the equator just like uh, airflow does. Now this is occurring very, very deep in the water. As a result, the less dense water is going to flow along the surface from the equator back up to the poles to sort of complete that cycle. So you basically get this sort of idea right here. So the water of the ocean can be divided into basically three density layers. You have the surface layer of water up here. You have what's called the uh, pycnocline layer, which is sort of this equilibrium area here, and then you have what's called the deep layer. This is where you got that sinking water, the dense water is going down to the sea bottom, where it's going to mix with all the murk and the gurk and the sediment and the nutrients. And by nutrients, we mean dead bodies. So as a result, you get this. This is what we call the Great Ocean Conveyor Belt because it looks a lot like a conveyor belt. You see you've got this deep flow going around the Arctic. That's down here, by the way, not up here where Santa Claus is not. So you have this deep flow going around the Arctic, and as it moves farther up towards the equator, it gets warmer, it rises, it goes back, 
and sort of creates this nice flow. And what this does is it does a couple of things. It allows for that vertical mixing so we can mix nutrients from the deep layers with the more shallow waters. But it also allows for mixing between your Pacific and your Atlantic oceans. And the Indian Ocean can play in there too. Yay, Indian Ocean. We'll make that an A for Atlantic Ocean. So not only are we mixing water from just the depth and the surface, but we're also mixing water around the different oceans. And this does a lot to really stabilize the climates on the planet. The thermohaline circulation, the deep, the great ocean conveyor, plays a huge role in climate stability. And one of the things that they, uh, the scientists think we could uh, change with all our pollutant hoodlum ways. So here is another diagram, shows you the whole picture, so you can see the whole Great Ocean Conveyor. Again, you see the water slinking along the surface for the most part, mixing, getting colder up here near the poles where it will then sink and then slink along the bottom until it comes to an area where it will then be picking up more heat. And so it basically does this and circulates around the entire world, transferring heat and changes in salinity along with it due to evaporation, etc., etc. What's really fun here is you can actually see that on the scale they're showing you the salinities of the oceans where these lighter colors, like in here, oh look at that stagnant water in the Mediterranean Sea, never mixes with anything else. Right, so that's one of the reasons why this is warmer, but also saltier, just ugh, salty water. But you can see how this cooler water up here, also less salty. You see how all that mixing occurs that drives the deep ocean conveyor. Here's another one showing you sort of a profile. So you can see that they took the whole world and they like tilted it like sideways like South America. Here you have North America up here, Africa. South America over here. And so you can actually see this mixing. This is a cross section of the Atlantic Ocean. And you see what happens with your subpolar areas. See what happens when the water converges and gets a little rough right in here. Oh, that's fun. Those are roughness. <clears throat> you see the water just moving all around. And you see the different density layers. Generally, three. This one's got a nice Antarctic bottom, super coldness water. But you see how it mixes and is exchanging water and heat and energy between the two hemispheres from South America and North America. Now, in case you didn't notice on the animation, this being the letter O, not a zero, definitely a capital O. If we pull up the animation here, in addition to seeing your gyres and your equatorial countercurrents, and you can even see the high latitude currents, you can also click this one here, and it'll show you the deep ocean circulation. What's really nice is it does a nice job of breaking it down for you and showing you how it's flowing and giving you some of the uh, different generalizing factors that are going into making this happen. So in the second part, uh, we can have a little discussion about some of the impacts that this has on the climate and what would happen if maybe this whole thing were to shut down. But in the meantime, thanks for watching, everybody. If you're watching this for the flip class, then Moodle links down in the doodle.